but sure. out of those proportion, they seem to have gone onto these conspiracy websites where they read up all this information on the MMR vaccine. And they tend to say, well, no, I, I, I don't think I'm going to vaccinate my child. And that's why we're starting to see um, uh, towards the last few years, uh, pockets of areas where there's been an increasing uh, incidence of um, uh, measles, for example. Um, and, and the doctor that actually did that research um, was discredited and struck off because the research was not accurate and it wasn't evidence-based. But once people lose confidence, then somehow through social networking and conspiracy websites, it seems to carry on. And it's a very difficult belief to then to break, you see. And that's why we need to sort of, uh, and it's difficult to weigh the evidence for a common person. Um, when I say common person, I mean a person who's, who, hasn't be, who hasn't studied that um, particular area of expertise to judge accurately if that is true or not. So as doctors, we, you know, we, we are taught evidence-based medicine and statistics, and we, we understand how to evaluate things based upon evidence, but our patients will not be. And so to instill that same confidence in them is sometimes difficult. And that's why it's important that the public has confidence in the coronavirus vaccine when it is issued or when it is released. It's, it's, it's really good that you've actually mentioned conspiracy theories in regards to these vaccines. Um, and and, and I, I think it's very important that now this comes from a, a doctor. Um, a lot of the conspiracies and a lot of the fake news that's going around is, uh, is, is that they're saying that this coronavirus is man-made and maybe it has something to do with biological and then some people um, go as far as saying that the vaccine itself is going to have some kind of a chip whereby there's going to be i know this is not your expertise but i feel that it's very important that this needs to come for you from yourself as a doctor uh, who knows what the vaccine is and what kind of chemicals are being used in vaccines um, that there is uh, no chips in there or anything like that, then this, this is this just conspiracy. Is that true? Yeah, I, I, I think an, any vaccine um, that is made um, for the benefit of vaccinating uh, us against illnesses um, is trialed and tested. And therefore, um, when it's trialed and tested, if there's any, um, any harm from that vaccine, it's actually shown in, in, in those trials. And then it has to go up to, to the government safety boards and they have to ensure that the vaccine is safe, again, with any drug, for it to be administered to the general population. Um, so if there was a microchip in there, for example, it, it would fail that particular test. And, and they are quite robust sort of areas of testing for any drug. Um, so for example, recently we have we always get notifications, this particular drug has a contaminant, please, we, you know, we've sent notices to the pharmacist to withdraw it, please do not issue, do not prescribe. So we take drug safety, um, drug administration, vaccine safety very importantly. And it is important that we have that, the population has that confidence. I think the issue of perhaps is that people who, um, and, I, and in conspiracy theories is not my, my sort of sure, uh, sure. experience, but if people lose confidence in experts, in medical experts, and they feel that medical experts and drug companies have some other agenda, then it fuels conspiracy theories. And I think that's why we need to be very open and upfront with our patients to say, look, this is what we, this is what I feel um, is, is um, uh, in the situation with vaccines, with drugs, and explain to them and overcome any ob objections they have. You can't stop people believing in conspiracy theories if they want to believe in something. That, 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 you know, that's their choice. It's a, it's a free country and they're free to believe what they like. But I think the most important thing is to look at things objectively and look at the evidence base for it. And when you try to look at the evidence base, you don't go on any website and say, already on a website. You actually look to see if there was any research done. If I sit here, for example, and I say that um, if you have, uh, if you cough five times, then you have a chest infection, um, and people take me for face value, and then someone coughs five times, they'll say I have a chest infection. But actually, if you then took 5,000 people 
and you then um, evaluated them and you found that only 10 people who coughed five times actually had chest x-rays which showed they had a chest infection and the remaining 4,990 people didn't, then the evidence is more in favour that coughing five times doesn't give you a chest infection. And those 10 people were probably by chance. So that's how it works. You have to look at the evidence and you have to look at the certainty of it and prove it statistically that it is beyond chance. Actually, there is something there. I kind of hope I've made that clear. Sure, sure. I have two final questions. Um, can COVID-19 uh, spread through blood transfusion? Uh, yes, it can. It can. It, it, there is the possibility that it can spread through blood transfusion. Um, so blood to blood contact, um, mucus to mucus contact, it can do. Okay. And finally, um, but, but I would qualify when we do blood transfusions, the, obviously the equipment is hygiene, it's clean, yes, yes, the blood is all tested absolutely. and everything. So, so any, any virus, any blood-borne virus or any virus can spread through tr blood transfusions. And that's why it's important that that equipment, that particular place is, is um, um, septic, clean, and they took all the precautions, which, which I'm sure they do. Following on to that, those who share needles, for example, there is a, a lot of drug addiction. Um, if there are any, any, any people who are sharing needles, can these be spread through sharing needles? As Absolutely well? can. Yes? Yes, it can. So we need to be very cautious for those who are sharing needles. Um, so people who are sharing needles, people who are um, sharing uh, other instruments when they are taking drugs, people who are um, even sharing syringes, breathing in, breathing out. Um, so any device, for example, if I breathe into it and then another person breathes in from that device. Um, sharing cigarettes, for example. Um, so if I was to smoke a cigarette and then give it to the next person. These are all risk factors, the, the risks of spreading COVID-19. And finally, sir, um, through uh, what we've learned, uh, um, the Asian and the black community uh, from the statistics uh, is that they are being affected more, up to 13%. Um, what is the reason for that? Well, that's an interesting question and I think it's a very valid question, an important question that does need to be addressed and I think Public Health England are going to launch an inquiry into that based upon the pressure from some of the MPs. Um, and I think it's important to wait for that inquiry to find out exactly what the factors are. In my own opinion, I think there's lots of factors, multifactorial. So the, the, the Asian patients that are being affected more are, are your sort of elderly patients. Sure. Patients who have other comorbidities such as high di high heart disease, diabetes, COPD. And there may be lots of Asian men who have undiagnosed high blood pressure. So they haven't been to the doctor and it hasn't been diagnosed. So they have undiagnosed diabetes or they're more prone or more susceptible to it. Um, and so the experts um, in secondary care in, in, in the universities are going to be doing research on this. Um, or it could be the fact that we live in um, conditions where we have lots of people living in one household and therefore it's much more easier to pass on. And then this brings you, uh, us on to the important point that you and I are both trying to make, which is that if then these people go out and don't socially isolate and they don't sort of take precautions, they will then spread it to other households and therefore the virus will multiply many forth. So I think there are lots of factors. Um, household, uh, number of people in a household, um, uh, deprivation in the general sense, uh, you know, um, also undiagnosed conditions. And could there be something in, 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 in the genes that could make making us susceptible? Um, it, it could be all these factors, but we don't know yet, for sure. Thank you very much. Um, just for the viewers, um, uh, Dr. Imran Sahib uh, was busy at work and he has all the facilities at home and he, uh, he could have come on via live streaming, but he chose to come to the Aluma Centre uh, to show that respect and, and that love, and we, we, we give that respect and love back to Dr. Imran okay. Hussain. And I'll tell you for why. One of the reasons is that, uh, mashallah, uh, Dr. Sab has been a great sp supporter for the Aluma Centre. 
But the other reason is that he's a frontline worker and he, he works for the NHS and we would like to thank Dr. Iman Hussain and all the NHS staff, whether they're doctors or whether they are uh, nurses. Uh, we just want to say from Zia Luma Center and I uh, speak on behalf of all the Imams uh, up and down the United Kingdom and we would like to thank you. I know on Thursday evenings um, there is a, a, a national, uh, nationally people come out to the streets and they applaud uh, these great people that are doing amazing work.